Well, hello, friends. Welcome to the Serenity OS update for August 2021. Uh, after the mad rush of June and July, we finally had a bit of a calmer month in the project again, uh, with 14 pull requests being merged every day and just over 1,500 commits from 89 different people. Um, it's still very, very active, but comparatively relaxing. Um, <laughs> and that's been really nice. So many people uh, have been on vacation in August, and many of them decided not to spend vacation at the computer. So uh, I hope everybody had a good and relaxing time. Um, but I have to say, it's really nice to see people kind of trickle back in. Uh, on Discord and GitHub and whatnot. So the most unexpected thing that happened in August was that Ars Technica did a feature article on Serenity OS, and it was a really nice piece, full of enthusiasm, but still grounded in realism. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I put a link to it in the video description so that you can check it out as well. Um, anyway. So let's just take a look around the system and see some new stuff from August. Okay, welcome to the August edition of Serenity OS. So the first thing I want to show you is something fun. It is uh, in the mouse settings. We now have a cursor theme tab here uh, where you can select different cursor themes. Uh, and we only have two. We have the, the default and the dark. Uh, and this was implemented by Mache, who also did the dark theme. So thank you, Mache. We'll be going with dark cursors from now on. Uh, and let me set up a mail account to show you the next thing. So I will just um, use Gmail here, put awkward cling. Uh, and the next thing is a password input dialog. So previously, we just awkwardly asked you for a password with no context. Now we have a uh, slightly more aesthetic um, dialog for this that tells you some context, like what is the server you're logging into? What is the username? Um, and then you provide the password. So this is just something I added. And um, something else, if we bring up the assistant, um, there hasn't been that much work on Assistant uh, lately, actually, but um, Carlos added a mechanism uh, to debounce UI updates so that if I start typing here, um, the Assistant itself does not flicker. Previously, it would flicker uh, as results would come in asynchronously from the various um, information providers. But now um, it is much, much nicer because it does not flicker. So. Uh, just a little thing, but something I really liked. And let's look at the 3D file viewer. So uh, you can now drag um, and wheel to zoom in and out here. Um, and this, of course, is our um, software implementation of OpenGL that uh, Stefan and Jesse and some other folks have been working on. And they, they continue. Um, working on this. Uh, Stefan has done a whole bunch of uh, feature work this month. Uh, and um, I particularly like actually this thing right here, show frame rate. I think Adam added this, but um, the fact that you can now get some kind of a feel for what the FPS might be, uh, even though it's software rendering, I like that. So thank you, Adam, for adding that. and. Thank you, everybody who works on um, the libgl uh, stuff. So something else is uh, audio. Uh, there's been a bunch of work on audio this month. Uh, for example, the settings that you put here into the audio uh, applet, they will now persist across reboot. Uh, we also remember the volume um, that you had when you reboot. Uh, and that was all done by Kleinus Filmrelchen. Um, and they've also been doing a whole bunch of audio things, like improving the FLAC support, um, support for switching the sample rate of the audio device. So you can now switch um, the hardware sample rate instead of just uh, resampling in software, 
which is pretty cool. Uh, and they've also started work on a DSP library, which is going to be used for uh, generating m music, generating sounds, basically. So very interesting work. And it's not the most demo friendly, but I hope that in the future, it will be something I could show you. And let me talk about my favorite subject in the whole world, uh, which is profiling, of course. So if we grab a profile of the JavaScript test suite, uh, and then we will open that up in the profiler. So let me just get that. Um, there are a couple of new things here. So the first one I want to show you is you notice all these purple lines here in the timeline. Um, each one of these is what we call a signpost. And signposts are a new mechanism where a profiled program uh, can emit a little uh, string that then ends up in the timeline here. So in this case, the JavaScript test suite runner program um, emits a signpost at the start of every test. So um, by looking through here, you can see which test uh, was running at which time. Uh, and for example, this is very helpful when you have something like this right here, where there's a um, there's a purple line for a new test starting, and then we go for a while. So you can see that this test actually runs for a bit, uh, and then you can select that part here and look at only uh, samples from that test. So very very helpful. Uh, and then I also added uh, automatic signposting for garbage collections, so they get kind of mixed in here right now. Uh, with the um, test name signpost. And there's we need to do more work on the UI and how to present all this information. But I love the fact that applications can now um, emit something that actually ends up in the profile where you can see it, because it makes them so much richer. Um, and they when they have kind of high level information about what was going on, because previously you, you could just look at the call graphs, right, and try to work out what was going on. But now the application you were profiling can tell you what was going on. And another thing that's new in Profiler is Flame Graph. So this was added by Nicholas. Uh, if you're familiar with Flame Graphs, and also that's Crashy, apparently. Uh, if you're familiar with Flame Graphs, uh, it is the, the same basic concept as anywhere else. Uh, where you you visualize um, hot code with the width of the um, flame part or whatever. Uh, and you can drill into subtrees or substacks, whatever you call them. Uh, I think we do need to work a bit on the text contrast here because it's a bit hard to read <laughs> some of these. But uh, very cool feature regardless. Uh, and this was implemented by Nick or Nicholas. So thank you, Nicholas, for the flame graphs. And I think now is a good time to give the floor to Linus, who's going to talk about um, JavaScript and libjs. So. so let's look at all the JavaScript changes this month in libjs. Uh, same as last month, I will start with some test 262 numbers. So in case you're not familiar, Test 262 is the official JavaScript uh, compliance test suite. And uh, we're running that on every pull request that gets matched. Uh, so we get updated results, and then we store them for a, a nice little progress tracking graph. So we started the month with 60.8% of passing tests and are now up to 64.6%. So about 4% uh, of uh, new passing tests, which is great. Uh, and that, of course, uh, goes up every month. So um, it's not going to be different next month as well. And then David started with a new proposal implementation. So there's a find last uh, and find last index stage three proposal, which we have now implemented, which is basically the same as uh, find and find index, but um, from the other end of the array. So um, if I say I have an array like that, um, and I want to find 
a number that is say larger than uh, three. So I get x, let's say x more than three. So the regular find uh, would then find uh, the number four. Oh, what did I mess up? Oh, x three. Yeah, so it would find the number four, obviously going from the front, but now I can say uh, find last which then goes from the back of the array and that will find the very last element, which is five. So uh, that works for both arrays and typed arrays. Um, and it's great to have just another stage three proposal implemented. Um, and then Tim did a lot of work on Unicode uh, again. So last month he did a lot on regexes. This uh, month this continues. So. We got, for example, now support for the um, Unicode property escapes, uh, which looks like this. So if I say I have a string, fuba, and in the middle I put an emoji. So in Serenity, that is um, Windows Alt Space. No, um, Control Alt Space, right. And then I put like a fire emoji in there. No, right. And then I say dot match. And oh, it crashed. <laughs> and now I can uh, say backslash p, which is then a property escape. And now I can put something like emoji. Um, and don't forget u for Unicode. And this will find the fire emoji, which is uh, really cool and quite useful. So uh, this also works for things like punctuation. Can say like foo dot bar comma bus exclamation point, and if I match that against p or punctuate punk, I just use the shorthand p um, again Unicode global, and I will get all the punctuation characters, which is quite nice. So that again is powered by uh, our own. LibUnicode, which in turn generates a lot of code from uh, Unicode uh, standard provided files. I have all sorts of uh, tables and uh, translations and all, all sorts of stuff. So uh, that was really cool. And then we implemented more of Temporal, of course. Uh, we, that is Eden and I. Uh, so we are up to about 75% now of all functions implemented. New this month uh, is zoned data, zoned date time, plain year month and plain month day. So uh, let's look at zoned date time. Why not? Um, new temporal dot zoned date time. I can say let's use epoch and a new time zone. Let's use UTC and that gets us a zoned date time. And uh, as usual, we have um, special pretty, pretty printing in the REPL. So we can basically look inside the object and see uh, it's epoch nanoseconds, it's time zone, it's calendar, that kind of stuff. And then of course we got uh, a lot of stuff on the prototype already. So you can, for example, query the year of that uh, date time, which is of course 1970, or we can um, convert it to a two year month. No. Oh, it's not implement. Uh, two plain year month. Wrong, wrong method. And then we can say two string on that, and then we get a year month to string. So yeah, uh, lots of progress on that. Uh, still not done, but um, they are still making tweaks to the spec. So we are also waiting on that uh, to be updated as well. And then Tim did uh, implement. Um, promise.all, promise.any, promise.all settled and race. 
So that's building uh, on top of the already existing promise implementation, uh, which is really nice. So you can say we make a promise um, like this, store the resolver function, um, let's make a global this.r equals r. And then we got a pending promise and a resolver function. And then we can say, um, let's, yeah, let's try promised at all. So that receives an array and I put in that promise and then I say then and console log like this. So now I got a different pending promise. And so once I resolve that first promise uh, with any value, um, no. Oh, I mistyped. <laughs> yeah, so uh, once all these are, are resolved, um, our attached promise handler fires and uh, then we can basically continue, which is really useful if you fetch several things at once, for example, and need to wait for all of them to complete. Uh, so yeah, that is a really nice work by Tim. And uh, David also started working on support for modules, um, currently only in the parser. So we got basic support for parsing import and export statements. Uh, so that's really exciting. Let's see how we go from there. Uh, David also did more correctness fixes in the parser. And um, I myself did some performance work lately. So improving the time it takes to construct a global object. So basically how long it takes for the engine to be ready to execute code. And then finally, Tim implemented um, intel.display names. So we started implementing the ECMA 402 uh, specification, which is separate from ECMA 262, which is basically JavaScript. Um, so that's the so so-called uh, internationalization API, and um, once again powered by our own lib Unicode. So let's have a look at that. Um, so we make a new Intel the display names, and then we pass a local en, and then we say we want. Um, let's try a language. So type colon language, and that's going to give us uh, display names for various languages in English. So um, if I now say off, that's going to be basically the target. Um, en is English, de German, fr French. And the really cool thing is that this is basically all auto-generated, as I mentioned. So we don't have to manually type out and get translations to all of these, but it's already in the Unicode standard. So we just grab those files, uh, do a bunch of code generation and get that for free, which is super nice. Um, also works for currencies. Uh, let's say USD, get US dollar, UR, Euro. So yeah, uh, that works nicely. Um, back to Andreas. All right. Thank you, Linus. So let's continue looking at some other applications, uh, starting with Pixel Paint. So uh, Pixel Paint has received a bunch of work this month. Uh, and something that I'm particularly fond of is these new widgets here called value sliders. And uh, they were added by Marcus. And it's a combination of a text input uh, with a slider that also has almost like a progress bar background. Um, and the idea is that you can slide to edit, but you can also type to edit if you prefer. And you also see exactly what the value is. Um, so it's kind of trying to be the best of both worlds. And uh, we're using it for the various tools in Pixel Paint. 
Um, and a new tool that we have this month is the guide tool. So this was added by Tobias, and it's a way to add these uh, helper guides that you can use to make sure that you're correctly aligned when you're drawing. Um, now, not everybody needs these, uh, of course. If you draw perfectly, then you don't need guides. But uh, for somebody like me who can sometimes struggle to align things perfectly, it's good to have a little bit of help. Uh, so thank you very much, Tobias, for adding the guides. And um, another thing, ooh, that's a lot of red. Uh, another thing that's new in Pixel Paint as well is uh, a new filter. So uh, it was David, I think, who added a new color filter called Grayscale. So it does exactly what you think it does, <laughs> just grayscales the layer. Uh, and by the way, if you want to remove a guide, just uh, select the guide tool, and then you can right click on the guides to delete them. So uh, a bunch of random things in Pixel Paint. Very nice to see this app um, sort of slowly but surely making forward progress. Um, I'm quite fond of it. So thank you, everybody who worked on it. Um, and then let's look at some command line stuff, maybe. So um, one thing that I really liked is that Seeking Blues added more support for history event designators. Uh, if you're familiar with uh, Bash, for example, then you have these things like uh, bang dollar or bang caret. Uh, and what these do is that they are substituted with, this is the last argument of the last command, and this is the first argument of the last command. So if you do, for example, foo bar baz, um, then now uh, bang dollar would be baz, and bang caret would be bar. So it operates on the, uh, or it, it, it fetches arguments from the previous command. Uh, so this would echo bar, um, and this would echo baz. And uh, it's one of those things that uh, is very small, but it's so embedded in my muscle memory from using Unix shells for so long uh, that um, I've tried to use them countless times in Serenity, and they didn't work. And then I was you know, kind of, and then forgetting about it. And I'm so grateful that Seeking Blues added these. So thank you very much. Um, and something I did for the shell this month is work on the time command. So if you are familiar, probably you are familiar, uh, but time allows you to time how long it takes to run something. So time ID, ID took 23 milliseconds. Uh, and we do something more complex, like list the entire content of the file system takes 100 or so milliseconds. Uh, but sometimes you want to run something a couple of times uh, to get an average um, or even a median uh, to get a feel for how fast something really is. Maybe you had an outlier because of external noise or whatever. Uh, and time now has dash n, uh, which allows you to specify a number of iterations. And then it will run the command that many times and then present a little bit of a timing report. So it tells you the average uh, runtime uh, of those 10 uh, iterations, uh, along with a median and a standard deviation. And this extra t statistics here were added by Tobias. So thank you very much, Tobias. Uh, and I quite like the excluding first feature, where it just um, is the same calculations, but it ignores the first run, uh, because often you have um, something that takes longer the first time you run it, and then it gets faster because uh, everything is in cache, you know, disk caches and, and whatnot. So uh, very often you want to uh, sort of discard the first run, and this kind of does that for you automatically by presenting the result with that excluded. Uh, and not strictly command line, but uh, something small that I saw that I really appreciated was uh, the shot command, which allows you to, to take a screenshot. I'll just take a screenshot of these two things right here. Uh, it now outputs the uh, resulting file name as a hyperlink, which means that you can just double click on it in the terminal to open up your file. Uh, or for some even deeper vertical integration, you can just drag. Oh, I thought you could drag. <laughs> Dang it. Um, 
Seems like we crashed something. Uh, well, here it is. You can drag that onto the desktop. Um, yeah, so sometimes we crash, of course. We've got to figure out what that was. Um, but I, I really like that. So now you can open that uh, immediately without having to type a command to open it. Uh, and that was done by Ryan. So thank you, Ryan. And speaking of very small things, um, there was another thing that I noticed also, which was the, in the calculator. So previously, uh, you had if you wanted to type to use it, you could do 1 plus 2 and then enter to get the result. Uh, but you couldn't press the equal sign to get the result. And um, somebody noticed this and made it so that the equal signs also produces the result. Uh, I think that was Scott. So thank you, Scott. Um, and these small things, I, I love them so much because they are, um, they, they may seem small and insignificant, but when you combine the force of thousands of these tiny little um, tweaks and improvements, it creates this feeling of quality that there's just no other way to achieve that but to actually go and do those thousand things. And it makes me so happy when I see people putting in the time and the effort to go and care about little things like that. Um, it really, really warms my heart. So thank you, everybody who has been doing any kind of polish this month. In fact, um, there's one person who was doing so much polish. It was uh, Karol. Uh, and there's all these tiny little things that he was doing, like um, making sure that the order of items in these context menus in the um, file manager, uh, that it, they have consistent order, like whether you open um, right click on a, something here in the right hand side, or if you click on the left hand side in this view, or if you right click on the desktop, um, the order of things in these menus used to be like slightly inconsistent. And now they're all consistent, like the open item is always first, uh, things like that. Uh, I, I really, really love when people do that. And um, I don't know. I just want to to mention these type of things because these are the things that really, really make a big difference uh, in my mind. Um, anyway, uh, enough gushing about the details. So, um, something I worked on a lot this month was the kernel, and it's a little bit sad because I can't really show much of the work, but uh, I can talk about it. So we've worked a lot on um, synchronization stuff and locking primitives with the eventual goal being um, getting multi-core support up and running and stable. So we do have basic multi-core support. Um, I have booted the system with ACPUs, but it is still unstable and it has a bit of a freezing tendency. Uh, but uh, a bunch of us have worked and done a whole lot of locking fixes and deadlock debugging and stuff this month. Um, myself, Tom, Brian, Andrew, uh, Sinak, and uh, Jean-Baptiste, and probably more people, but I don't recall right now. Uh, and I really, really appreciate everybody helping out with um, these issues because Debugging deadlocks is pretty tedious, a bit boring, <laughs> uh, and um, it's, it's so much easier when, when we're helping each other out with it. Uh, and we're getting there. We're, we're getting it there. Um, I, I don't know exactly when we'll get it to a uh, stable enough state to run always, but um, it feels like it's within reach. Uh, another thing that has been improving greatly is our out of memory handling situation. So um, Brian has continued to work tirelessly, uh, it seems, on um, beefing up our robustness in the face of out of memory conditions. So um, there was a funny thing where Luke was talking on Discord about how he was trying to panic the kernel by making it run out of memory. Uh, and he said that, that it was actually difficult to get it to panic. Uh, and uh, uh, if you've been around the system for a while, you probably remember 
uh, that it used to be not very difficult to panic the kernel uh, due to low memory conditions. So it was quite awesome to see um, to see that somebody was struggling to panic it. Um, very, very awesome work by Brian just uh, going through the kernel with a fine tooth comb, um, switching away from um, unsafe data structures to, to um, um safe data structures and things like that. And just rethinking the way we handle allocation failures everywhere. It's a huge task and uh, it's so cool to see that the progress is actually happening and now people are starting to notice that it's becoming more stable. Uh, so very, very awesome. Um, other stuff in the kernel is uh, USB 2 support is ongoing. So Luke has been working on that and uh, Jesse was working on that a bit as well. Um, and something I did for the kernel was also uh, that getting the time of day no longer requires making a syscall. So previously you had to call either clock get time or get time of day to get the current time. Uh, but that was, uh, had a lot of overhead, of course, because you call into the kernel just to ask what time it is. So we do, we now do the same thing as uh, Linux does, for example, where um, we have a, a special page of memory that's mapped both into the kernel and into user space processes. And then the kernel just, um, whenever the clock changes, the kernel just puts the current time in there. And then user space programs can read the current time from there without having to call into the kernel. Uh, and I think that that's a really, really nice mechanism. Um, and I originally wanted to do it because our Quake 2 port uh, was checking the current time over and over. And I thought, well, the way to make this faster, I guess, is to uh, is to, to remove the syscall. So that's what I did. Um, then it turned out that they're still just checking the current time over and over uh, in a silly loop. So that's a separate problem entirely. And uh, But I still feel good about, about the change. It's a very, very sensible thing. And our own programs uh, do a lot of current time checking as well. So um, it's not like wasted work or anything like that. Uh, if we step outside of the system and look um, at the meta level, uh, there have been some interesting developments. So uh, we now have a Clang build, um, thanks to the hard work of uh, Daniel. And that means that we build a Clang tool chain and then compile the system with Clang. Um, and this is happening on our continuous integration system as well. Uh, and it turned out that when we added a second tool chain in addition to our GCC tool chain and running all of that on the GitHub uh, CI system made it unbearably slow. Uh, so we have also now added Azure um, to the continuous integration system and the various things are divided between GitHub and Azure which is really awesome. And I want to thank especially Tim uh, and Linus for um, for getting the Azure stuff up and running. That's been really cool. Um, and another thing also outside is uh, we started running the Sonar Cloud static analysis stuff um, on the entire code base. And that was Brian who set that up. So. Uh, it's, we just got the first report two days ago, uh, and I've been sifting through the various complaints. And as with any static analysis, there's a lot of false positives and um, less useful complaints, but there seem to be real bugs that it finds as well. So that's really cool. Uh, and we get to go through those and, and fix the issues. Um, and I'm always super happy to see more static analysis uh, any issues that can be detected at compile time uh, or outside of runtime in any way uh, are always excellent. So super thanks to Brian for setting that up. And now I think I'm going to pass the floor back to Linus once again to talk about libweb. Okay, so let's look at the browser and libweb changes this month. So first of all, uh, very early in the month, Sam did the final PR to uh, remove the 
old CSS parser, so everything is now using the new one, uh, which is great because we had uh, two going on at the same time for a while, which was a bit annoying, but that is now uh, completed. So, and on top of these changes, he then implemented various new CSS features. Uh, for example, let's start with fonts. So he did uh, greatly improve our font uh, implementation and capabilities. So um, as you can see in this demo, there's a lot going on, uh, various font types, font sizes, um, bold, not bold, italic. Um, so this includes implementation of uh, font fallback, um, implementation of non-pixel sizes. So you can say percentage or um, other units that are not pixels, uh, as well as numeric font weights. So instead of saying bold, you can say like 300, 400, uh, 800, all these things. So that is uh, working great. And uh, Tobias did some work on Flexbox. Um, nothing I can demo right now, but uh, Flexbox uh, already made some great progress last month and is still going uh, into a good direction. Still lots of work to do, but uh, steadily improving. So that is really good. Um, Sam also did uh, implement the unset, initial and inherit built-in CSS values. So I uh, have a little demo in the text editor here, which if you didn't know has um, HTML preview. So it's great for demoing or prototyping. So um, we have an element with uh, some style applied and then inside we have a little span element and it says color unset. And then you see the color changes from blue to the as if uh, no color was set. So the default is black, um, quite useful. Uh, then Carol added support for the CH unit. So I think that stands for character. Uh, it's the width of a uh, zero character. So um, that is not complete either, but uh, pretty good progress on that. And then, oops, uh, a very interesting change is that Andreas removed a single process mode from the browser. So Previously, we had um, single and multi-process mode. So for a while, single process mode was the default and when we switched it uh, to multi-process mode and now um, multi-process mode is the only mode. So if you say browser dash up, um, there used to be an option for dash s single, um, which is no longer available. So we wanted to move uh, away from Single, browser mode, uh, single process mode entirely. So that is a step into that direction. And back to Andreas. All right, I think that was everything we had to show you today. So thank you all so much for checking in and staying up to date with the project. Um, since May of this year, I'm doing this full time and my work on Serenity OS is funded by viewers and fans of the system. So if you would like to help me continue doing this, do check out the links in the video description. Uh, and as of a while ago, you can also support Linus. Uh, Linus does a huge amount of work on the system and has been growing a supporter base of his own on GitHub sponsors. Uh, and you can find links to that in the video description as well. Uh, and from the both of us, a huge, huge thank you to everybody for the support. Uh, if you want to come chat, do join the Serenity OS Discord server. There's a link in the video description. Uh, and I also host a weekly live stream now here on YouTube. It's every Friday at 4 p.m. Swedish time. Uh, it's called Serenity OS Office Hours, and everybody is welcome to ask whatever they want to know about Serenity OS. So, yeah. That's it for today. So thank you for visiting, and I will see you all next time. Bye.